So in this video, we're going to continue with the finite quantum well. And specifically, we're going to apply the boundary conditions. So in the last video, we said if we've got this finite quantum well of some height, uh, let's call it V naught. So this is the energy barrier that electrons see inside the well. And we've got some electron inside the well with certain energy, E, uh, relative to the bottom, which we called zero. And we don't know what this energy is, but we'd like to figure it out. And we said that the wave functions on this right hand side, or on this left hand side, just by looking at the differential equation, so the form of the differential equation that the second derivative uh, with respect to psi is equal to some uh, coefficient squared times psi. And I called this alpha on the left and the right hand side and k in the middle just to distinguish the two. Uh, but we said that in this region, the wave function looked like just from the differential equation alone, uh, a e to the plus alpha x plus b e to the minus alpha x. And just to uh, be clear, this is our x coordinate. So this is the x direction. And we've defined x equals 0 to be at the center of the well. Well, we can make a, another argument because if the wave function looked like this, so if it looked like b e to the minus alpha x, and in this case, x is going to, as we approach the left, x is becoming more negative. So this b e to the minus alpha x, this term starts looking like this. It grows and grows and grows, and it's completely unbounded. And so this is not a physical solution uh, to the Schrodinger equation. And so we can just ignore that on accounts of it blows up as you get further and further away from the well. So that's nice, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, and we can make the same exact argument on the right-hand side. Uh, the equation has to look like what I call these coefficients. I think d e to the, let's say d e to the minus alpha x plus e e to the plus alpha x. And as we go to the right, x is becoming more positive. And so if we had this term in the solution, if we had an e to the plus alpha x in the solution, then similarly the wave function would just blow up as you get further and further away from the well. And this is also not a physical solution to Schrodinger's equation because we expect the wave function to be normalizable. We expect it to have finite, um, a finite integral under, under the curve. And just to be absolutely clear, these are the solutions to the wave function as a function of x in the different regions. So to the right of the quantum well, we have this solution, d e to the minus alpha x. To the left of the quantum well, we have this other solution. And in the middle, we said that, again, just by looking at the differential equation, we had some combination of sines and cosines. So c times sine of kx, kx, uh, plus, oh no, I've reused d. Uh, sorry, let's, let's call this coefficient e then, and let's call this coefficient d. Uh, d cosine of kx. And in the last video, we said that we just defined k uh, to be equal to 2me over h bar squared. And similarly, alpha was 2m times v naught minus e over h bar squared. And those are just variables. Like we just uh, made that substitution to make life look pretty because I don't want to be writing things to the square root of energy and it just makes everything hideous. Um, and we can actually simplify these solutions a little further. So we can make, new, we can make use of uh, a symmetry theorem in quantum mechanics, which basically says if you have a symmetric potential, so a symmetric V of X, then your solutions are either even or they are odd. And so an even solution is just a one that's symmetric about x equals zero. And similarly, odd is one that's anti-symmetric. So it goes positive in one direction, negative in the other. So our solutions are either a sine or a cosine, but not a combination of both. And that's, that's interesting. Um, but that means that we, we only have to deal with one at a time. And first, we'll deal with the cosine. Uh, so first, we'll just assume that the solution has only a cosine term in it. And this will actually be true for all of the states, uh, n equals one, our ground state, n equals three, and so on and so on. And so now let's just sketch what we have, what we have figured out underneath. So we found that 
on the left hand side the solution has to look like an exponential that decays off to the left on the right hand side it has to look like an exponential that's decaying off to the right and in the middle uh, in the middle it has to look like some cosine function maybe it's got one period maybe it's got multiple periods we don't we don't actually know at this point and so our goal is to stitch these wave functions together so we want the wave function psi of x to be continuous and we want its derivative psi prime of x to be continuous in other words we want some solution that looks like looks like this kind of like a cosine in the middle or maybe it's got a couple of wiggles and then goes off to the side but it has to be continuous and its derivative has to be continuous so it has to be smooth and this is just a consequence uh, of the differential equation itself uh, and the the nature of the potential and I'm also going to make another claim here so we have the solution on this side a e to the plus alpha x and on the other side we've got the solution e e to the minus alpha x I'm going to say that because this system is symmetric a and e are the same so a and e have the same value or we can just call we could just call both of them a and if you wanted to derive that you wanted to rigorously prove that you could apply the boundary conditions first at this interface and then at this interface and you'd find that yes they indeed have to be equal but doing this will allow us to only apply boundary conditions at one interface so if this is x equals zero uh, then we can choose to apply a boundary condition at minus L over 2 so where L is the L is the length of the quantum well and so let's do that let's actually set the wave function and its derivative equal to itself so it has to be continuous in other words so a e to the plus alpha uh, minus L over 2 has to equal um, C times cosine of k minus l over 2 and so I've just plugged in a e to the plus alpha x has to equal c times cosine of kx where x is equal to minus l over 2 and so we can simplify this a little bit just rearranging stuff so a e to the minus alpha l over 2 has to be equal to c times cosine of kl over 2 and I've just used the property here that uh, cosine of minus x is equal to cosine of x just so I can get rid of minus signs because I hate minus signs and this is our first equation so we're gonna need three in total because we don't know a we don't know C and we don't know the energy e uh, so we need three equations and we're gonna get two of them from applying the boundary conditions at this interface so now let's do the second one uh, let's the derivative of the wave function has to be continuous so the derivative uh, let's just take the derivative of both sides of this equation so here on the left hand side we've got alpha times a e to the plus alpha x has to equal uh, k or minus k sine of kx oh and it looks like I've dropped a c there so it should be minus k times c of sine of kx and if you plug in x is equal to minus l over 2 you'll get the second equation which is alpha a e to the minus alpha l over 2 is equal to k times c times sine of kl over 2 and here similarly I've just used the property that sine is odd or sine of minus x is equal to minus sine of x and so now we have two equations but we said we have three unknowns we've got alpha or we've got a c and then we've got the energy and once we know the energy we know alpha and we know k because we assume that we know the potential v naught of this system so where does this third equation come from well the third equation comes from our definitions of alpha and k so we've got k is equal to 2m e over h bar squared and alpha is 2m v naught minus e over h bar squared and so from these two definitions we'd like to generate an equation that is like easy to use uh, fairly independent of 
uh, maybe even independent of the energy, um, so it's a decoupled equation. And you might notice that these two terms are of ex almost exactly the same form. One's got an E, and one's got a V minus E. So it would be nice if we could cancel the E's to just get an equation that doesn't involve the energy at all. Um, and so the way that we could do that is by taking the square of each of these uh, coefficients and adding them. So if we do that, uh, k squared plus alpha squared, we'll just have 2me over h bar squared uh, plus 2m v naught minus e over h bar squared. That'll just equal 2m v naught over h bar squared. And this is really interesting. Uh, and this is actually what will lead us to using uh, what we'll do in the next video, which is graphically solving this problem. And so now we have one equation in terms of alpha and k, and that's just two unknown variables instead of the three that we had to deal with before. So the question is, can we look at this set of equations up here and get something that's just in terms of alpha and k? Uh, like, can we somehow get rid of this A and this C in these two equations? And you might notice if you stare at this for long enough that if you divide one of these equations by the other, then all of the A's and C's, these extra coefficients, will cancel out. So if we divide equation two by equation one, which we can do because we're just dividing two things that are equal by two other things that are equal, uh, you'll get the equation alpha is equal to k times tangent of kl over 2. And so now we've got two equations. Like before we had to deal with three, but now we only have two. Uh, this alpha equals k tan k over 2, or k tan kl over 2, and this equation that looks a whole lot like a circle. And so we have two coupled equations just in terms of alpha and k. And so we can sort of solve these on their own and then go back and solve for, if we want to, uh, a and a, c, and the energy. Because once we know k, we know how the energy depends on it, so we can just solve for it directly. Uh, and once we know, similarly, once we know k, uh, alpha, and the energy, we can fairly easily solve for the coefficients a and c. But often we won't need to, which is, which is also kind of cool. Because often we're only interested in the energy eigenstates or the energy eigenvalues of a system. So the ground state, uh, the second excited state, and so on and so on. And so in the next video, we're going to go over how do we take these two equations and turn this into a solution that's sort of uh, intuitive and uh, will allow us to make predictions about how these finite quantum wells will behave and especially how they differ from infinite quantum wells. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please don't forget to like and subscribe below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.